everybody and welcome to this week's Thrive Tribe. It's good to have you here. Um, I have had uh, Christmas in July this weekend and I had my nieces playing on my whiteboard a lot and I somehow ended up with sparkles on my whiteboard and on my, my whiteboard marker which is extraordinary. Um, <clears throat> so if I rub the board out you might see sparkles which will be really special. So today I want to talk to you about um, conversations because I think that there's often conflict around conversations that are just not being had and there we go that's a reminder for something um, and that we we have the conversations in our head and we might have conversations with other people but we don't actually talk to the person that we have this conflict with and let's just remind ourselves about what conflict is conflict is a personal an interpersonal situation where something's happened that triggers us to have a stirring and un, an unhappiness uh, an agitation uh, in here and in here and we react to it and sometimes we don't let the other person know that we're having these thoughts that we are actually in conflict with the other person and sometimes we do and when we do then we can usually there's some chance that we can resolve it when it's just up in here uh, or we're telling friends rather than the person, then we've got less chance of resolving it. And I can't tell you how many times people are having conversations with me. And look, I am absolutely in this camp as well. We all do it. We're all, we're all prone to this, where we will complain to somebody about somebody else's behaviour. And in my brain, I'm thinking, this is just a conversation. We just need to have a conversation and then we'll know where we stand. But we don't have that conversation. We have the conversation with somebody else. So let's just have a look at this. So say I'm A and somebody over here called B, Betty, uh, has done something or acted in a way or said something that I have reacted to. So. Betty's going along, doing her own thing, and she might have not, not said hello to me, and I feel like I've been dissed. She might have uh, said something about my work in a meeting without checking with me. She might have taken claim for something. She might have um, not paid a bill. She might have done a whole range of different things. and. I have read that information as a red flag and I'm going whoop, 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 whoop. Uh, well there we go Irish. so I've got all agitated because of something that B has done or hasn't done uh, I've seen it I might have heard it somebody else Charlie might confirm it because I've spoken to Charlie and they say, yeah, B did that. B didn't smile at you. But B, you know, Betty, Betty took credit for this the other day or whatever it is. And so we might get reassurance from an, a third party confirming our suspicions that Betty is, Betty doesn't like me or Betty's trying to cut my lunch or Betty's trying to take credit for my work or Betty's doing something that I don't like. And so I start talking to lots of people to confirm that Betty is wrong. So I'll talk to Dave and Ed and Fred, oh look at all those names, and I'll talk to all of these people to confirm my beliefs about Betty. But the one thing I won't do is I won't talk to Betty. And I won't talk to Betty because that's going to be quite uncomfortable. Um, I think in my mind, I've already worked it out, that the conversation with Betty is going to be really uncomfortable and it's actually just easier to blame Betty and talk about her negatively to all these people than to talk to Betty. Now, the problem with that is I have now created a whole heap of beliefs in other people's heads about Betty's behaviour that may or may not be true because at this stage I haven't spoken to Betty so I don't actually understand her motivation for doing what she's done. 
and she may have no motivation. Like she may not even know that she's done this. There may be, there may be absolutely nothing here. But at this stage, I've engaged a whole tribe of people in my conflict with Betty that doesn't actually exist except here because I haven't had the conversation. So I see this in workplaces all the time, that there are whispers and gossip and sides being taken about situations which is just a conversation away from being fixed. It's actually, it's at this stage, it's nothing. We don't know what it is. It's just nothing. So I have to learn to be brave and to have that conversation with Betty. And what I'm probably going to find out is that when I do have that conversation with Betty, that it's actually not as painful as I thought it was going to be. That in fact, I've misread the situation completely. I can't tell you how many times I've misread situations completely. And in my brain, I've turned it into World War III and it was absolutely nothing, just nothing. So what we as leaders need to do is if we've got people like me coming to you complaining about the actions of B and I haven't spoken to B yet, then you as a leader have a responsibility to stop this. Because at the moment, A is being more destructive than B because A is complaining to everybody who listen about how bad B is. And that's unsettling the team and completely unfair on poor old Betty here who may not have done anything, who, who, who may have done something and, and wasn't aware that what they'd done had created a problem. But there's no way of fixing the problem until A speaks to B. So as leaders, we have a responsibility to say, A, uh, this is not okay, we need you to, to get this sorted, this can't go on, so I need you to have a chat with B. And A's gonna go, <gasps> but I, I can't because B's mean to me and I'm feeling bullied and I don't like what's going on here. And it's like, unfortunately, there's nothing in what I can do to help you unless you speak to B. And also, until you speak to B, I'd really like it if you don't speak to anybody else about this because you haven't made any effort to resolve the problem. So, gulp. A has to speak to B. And that means that A's got to put her big pants on and go and talk to B and say, hey B, um, this happened the other day and I felt really like you didn't like me when you didn't look at me or when you didn't say hello or when you referred to my work and you didn't give it credit. I just was feeling really uncomfortable. And B will go, oh, I didn't mean to not say that. I was, I was so busy the other day. I've got, you know, you've got no idea what I'm going through at the moment. You know, I've got a, an elderly mother that's really sick and my kids were in hospital and, and suddenly you go, oh, oh, and you recognise that B's human and has a life and gets distracted and behaves exactly the same way that you do about a whole range of different things and you've just misjudged the situation and in the meantime you've also told all these other people and you've embarrassed B for no particularly good reason. So I think... We, there are many, many, many conversations that just don't happen and we get caught up in the drama and we don't deal with the issue. There's another conversation that doesn't happen very often and it's a, one I see in family businesses a lot. So in family businesses, um, we, there's often issues around who's the boss. So... Who is the boss? So this is a conversation that sometimes doesn't happen because it's really uncomfortable. And this is family, so we do take it far more personally and there's usually other underlying issues that we haven't resolved or dealt with over long periods of time. So people can get really, really stuck. But one of the conversations that often is like a great big elephant in the room is when there's been a succession and a mum or a dad has passed the business on to the next generation, but they're still there, they're still in the business, they're still having their two cents worth, they're still dominating conversations and thinking and processes and policy. 
And that is a conversation that's often very difficult because the person who's taken over has to go to their parent and say, you've handed this over to me and I now need you to distance yourself from the business and just let me get on with it. I know you love this business very much. I know it's really important to you, but you hand it over to me and I need you to trust me and we need to find a way to work this together because the way it's working at the moment doesn't work. Because what happens is when you don't have a boss is that the rest of the staff don't know who to turn to. So say we've got uh, Alex here and Alex is the child of, I'm trying to be completely non-sexist here, Cameron's a name you can now say, and we're going to go with an interesting spelling. So Alex is the child of Cameron, and Cameron was in charge, it was Cameron's business, and Cameron started this business from scratch. They had it for 30 years, they've developed it, they've grown it, it's going really, really well but they do need to step back from the business. The only way the business is going to grow and move forward is Cameron needs to move out of business. And so Cameron has said, okay, Alex, I want you to take over the reins. You can have the business. I'll just be here to support you. I'll just be here to support you. I, I won't interfere, I'll just be here to support you. But what happens is, is that Alex goes to make a decision and Cameron doesn't like it. And so Cameron then does something which might undermine the decision. And suddenly the team who are meant to be going to Alex start going to Cameron and they go back to there because they say, well, you haven't been able to override the power of Cameron yet. And we need to know who the boss is because that's really important to us because that keeps us safe. So we're going to go back to Cameron. Now, if that situation continues, then Alex is going to be completely undermined. And then when Cameron really does exit the business because of ill health, death or something terrible or whatever, then Alex has lost a whole heap of power in this process because Cameron kept undermining Alex. So family business, you have to have those conversations. People need to know who the boss is. When people know who the boss is, that helps them feel safe. There are lots and lots of conversations happening in business every day that are really positive, and there's a whole lot of conversations that are not happening here, but they're happening not between A and B. Oh no, we're having C, D, E, we've got anything but this. Let's have conversations. If you, want to, if you want to reduce the amount of conflict in your office, if you want to improve uh, productivity, if you want to stop unplanned leave, if you want people to get on with the job, don't let them buy into this stuff. Um, because it just means that you're, everyone's wasting their time gossiping about things that are not true. We, we don't know what people have done or what their intentions are if we don't ask them. But when we have the conversation, we usually find out that we have inflamed the situation significantly in our own brain because we're scared or because we don't want to have that conversation or whatever. But it's what we do to ourselves. It's our thinking that's the problem, not necessarily the behaviour of Betty, poor Betty. Um, so I hope that's really helpful to you. Conversations are crucial. So... Um, for the record, I have uh, over the weekend created a new course that's going to be rolled out very, very soon. Uh, it's going to be how to deal with a conflict situation when it first arises. And this is specifically uh, aimed at leaders. And what I've done is I've broken down how to deal with the various personality types that are going to come to you with problems. So we've used the DISC process and we have a look at how likely it is that a, 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 a D, I, S or C, how they're going to respond to the situation and how you can work with them to encourage them and empower them to deal with the issue themselves and to have these conversations. Because often what they're doing is, so often, is that people are coming 
to you with a problem about somebody else that they would like you to fix. The old handball, would you please take this problem for me? I don't want it. Here, you have it boss, you're the leader, you deal with it, I'm gone. And you need to learn how to empower your team to have those conversations so that one, you get your time back, um, which is just incredibly important, so you can get on with your own job, but also so you can be the leader, so that you can spend your time leading and developing relationships with the team that are really positive, rather than spending all of your time putting out fires. So that is going to be a standalone course and that will be released um, via my website and various places uh, in the next couple of weeks. So that's really good. Uh, my podcast is hopefully going to launch this week. So I've recorded about seven um, interviews so far and that's a whole heap of fun. So as soon as that is launched, I will let you know. And also there's a special deal for Teams That Thrive. So I have sort of rejigged the model and I'm running Teams That Thrive as a three month program. It's an online coaching program. You get to do a one-on-one -on -one with me to sort of get work out what's going on. So we do a strategy session together. Then you have access to a whole range of materials um, about all the elements that are in my Team Harmony model. Uh, you can download a whole heap of worksheets and uh, then there's fortnightly group coaching calls. Uh, now, it's normally priced at $7.99 if, um, if you buy it as a lump sum. It's $900 if you pay it for three months, over so $300 over three months. But for teams that thrive, people from my Thrive Tribe, my, my fa Facebook group, I'm offering it to you at $5.99. So, um, if you want to do that program, it is going. It is a spectacular program. It has helped so many people. I've done it in house with lots of people, and now to make it more accessible, I'm rolling it out online. So please let me know if you're interested. Just uh, send me an email saying Teams That Thrive, and I'll get back to you straight away, and we can make that happen. Um, I hope that that's been helpful for you today. I hope you have a great week. I'm really sick of winter, I'm just throwing that in, but I'm really sick of winter. I'm really looking forward to warmer mornings and going out without having to put all these layers on. Um, but that's just my whinge for the day. I can't, I'm not quite sure who to complain to, so I'm just gonna to complain to everybody about the weather. All right, have a good one, everybody. See ya.